Welcome to Talks Key to Masculinity, where we talk about political culture, pop culture, drinking culture, and anything else that comes up. Joining me as always today is Brandon. Hello, my people. Kale. Hello. And Jim. Power to the people. All right, today we've got a nice light little topic that will be totally non-controversial in any way, shape, or form, and that is class in America. Um, so I'm sure that everybody will be totally on board and we won't have anybody calling us horrible, horrible people in the comments. Um, but uh, before we talk about class, we have to talk about what we're drinking. So, uh, Kale, since you were uh, to my immediate uh, left, on my screen anyway, um, what, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, I thought since we were going kind of heavy on the subject, I would keep my flavors sweet. So from Take Time Brewery, I have Oreo Speedwagon Chocolate Vanilla Milk Stout. You said a mouthful. Lining Kugel's Chocolate Dunkel. And to uh, cap it all off, Shiner's Candy Pecan, which I will be using a church key ironically, to open my alcohol. Fair enough. Brandon, what are you having tonight? Uh, I I rarely go with any kind of theme, so I just poured something I thought sounded good. I am having a white rum Negroni. White rum Negroni. And Jim? Uh, I'm going basic, uh, Crown and Coke. Long live the royalty. Fair enough. Socialized healthcare. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm drinking rye uh, because... Rye is middle class. Rye is a, rye is a very American spirit. Um, it's, it's Canadian to some degree too, but I think uh, before we got into bourbon, before we got into a lot of other things, um, rye was sort of one of the first spirits that America got into. And uh, plus it just tastes good. Like that, that peppery, peppery whiskey. Um, so first of all, I, I thought one of these interesting, I, I looked up a class on dictionary.com, which as a really terrible college student is of course the first thing you do when you're looking up anything uh, you're researching. And I thought it was interesting. Dictionary.com has uh, 25 definitions for class. Um, I think class is, class is such an interesting, I mean, just take all the politics and everything else that it's a very interesting word and it's used in a, in a wide variety of, of ways. Uh, but I'm going to read sort of just a couple of the uh, ones that are sort of uh, relevant to us. Um, class is a social stratum sharing basic economic, political, or cultural characteristics and having the same uh, social position. A system of deciding, uh, dividing society, caste, uh, social rank, especially high rank, and members of a group in society regarded as a single entity. Um, oh, also, I'm sorry. Also, any division of persons or things according to rank or grade. Um, so it kind of shows you that the class is, is sort of a, a, a tough thing to, to deal with directly. I don't know. Just, just what are some initial thoughts? What, what do you guys think of just right off the top of your head when, when somebody talks about class? What, what do you think, Kale? Uh, well, along the lines that you're going with, uh, when I was looking up some stuff, uh, I wanted to point out specifically uh, that it dictated to social, economic, and location status, and some of the factors that go into the definition that you're giving uh, are wealth, income, education, occupation, hierarchy, subculture, and social network. Um, it says it's not supposed to apply to race or religion, but this is America, and America is very judgy. And I think that those factors do come into play. Um, I think that class is very much used to separate us. And I'm yeah, absolutely. That at that, there's much more to talk about. <laughs> okay, Brandon, just right outside. What, what are your sort of just real initial thoughts? I tend to think of it as uh, pretty binary. If you own the means of production, you're part of the ruling class. If you don't, you're part of the working class. Yeah, by the way, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, one of the, the sources that you sent over, I had a little bit of a disagreement with because I don't see it as quite as binary, I guess. But it, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and Jim, what, what do you sort of have as your initial thoughts? Um, so one of the things that stood out to me when you're reading the definition was uh, rank and grade. And it made me immediately think of low class. Like it's uh, some of it's really loaded in, uh, in judgment that. You know, if you are not upper middle class, then maybe you're not working hard enough. Um, 
and uh, there's way too little consideration in our culture to um, advantages that people have uh, from their environment, their family, uh, the neighborhood, and uh, also too little bit of appreciation that um, life is random. And just because some people get lucky and uh, are able to matriculate up the class ladder doesn't mean that the system's working great and anyone could do it if they just pulled themselves up by the bootstraps. Um, Which, by the way, is one of those things I, I always feel the need to point this out. The bootstrap idea was always meant as a joke right. uh, until until the right wing uh, sort of adopted it as, as like, like it's a real thing. I mean, the joke is you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps because they're your boots. I mean, it's, it was originally invented as a, a, a sort of parody critique of right-wing ideology that you literally can't because it's, it's impossible. And then uh, the right-wing just sort of adopted that. But the, it, doesn't that just really, I don't know. I feel like that's profound because I feel like that's so much of our politics that it actually doesn't make any sense. You can't do it yet. There's a huge segment of our population that absolutely believes that that's how it is. Yeah, um, I think that's absolutely true. Well, so, when you're talking about like a caste system, you're not allowed to move out of there. Right. And I think that is at least something you can tangibly like you can just give up on worrying about that part you can let that kind of anxiety go i think i think it's why class is a little more sinister than cast in that sure some people do move up but it's usually through like a stroke of luck you know finding you know a good gambling or you know happen to bet on the right stock market or something but it's not usually like it, it's it's a one-time thing. Usually if you look at that family later on, like lottery winners don't stay upper class. They don't stay uh, owners or anything like that. They tend to fall back out very quickly. And I think that plays into the system. It allows them to say, look, anybody can move up. <laughs> yeah, technically. But the odds are that you're not going to stay there with the old money, the, the people that have been at the top for generations. Well, actually, Brandon, that, that's actually a good segue and something else I want to. So uh, uh, Brandon's got a whole bunch of stuff prepared for us, and I think he's going to be sort of leading the charge here, or at least in the beginning part of this anyway. Um, but I wanted to bring up something else. And Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think you're primarily going to talk about class as sort of an economic and political uh, from an economic and political perspective. Um, and. Uh, the, what I would say is that if you if you really want to get in depth on studying class, there is also just a social dimension. Um, so it is, for example, I, well, you know, all of us, like not, I don't think any of us were born particularly wealthy. Um, growing up in the Midwest, uh, with you know, I don't know if any of us grew up, grew up dirt poor, but we definitely didn't grow up rich. Um, there's more separating us from somebody like, let's say, the Bushes, um, than just money. Um, so even if I, you know, let's say I, I invented a, you know, brand new solar powered cement mixer um, and made $10 million um, and was in the same wealth bracket as, you know, the Bushes or, you know, any of the other rich families, I definitely would not be welcome at their garden parties. Um, and so, well, I don't know if the social aspect of class is the most important aspect, it definitely does exist. And, and I think it, it is important. It is worth sort of noting, um, you know, somebody well, who wins the lottery is not going to be welcome at the Rothschild, you know, family Christmas. Well, and it's when people talk about class reductionism, they're talking about stating as class is the main problem over any other thing. Like if I were to tell a feminist that the patriarchy is not that big a deal, it's class. Or if I were to tell, you know, uh, people of color that uh, racism and bigotry aren't really the problem, it's, it's class. That would be class reductionism. Um, I tend to think of class mostly as the uh, political thing. And to me, that seems awfully binary. 
I never really even considered the uh, social aspect of it. Well, but and I mean, like again, if, you, if you've ever, uh, I mean, we, I think most of us grew up in smaller towns, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, in my, in my small town anyway, um, there was a class distinction and it wasn't, it, it wasn't just about how much money people made. It was about, you know, are you, are you, um, you know, do you wear the right clothes? Do you, and, and again, that is related to money. They're not, you know, you can't separate them necessarily, but they're not the same thing. You know, you could have a family who maybe had money, but was maybe in uh, a profession that was seen as being less, you know, upper crust. So let's say, let's say you have a family, like most places, you have a family that's rich because they're trash collectors. They own a, you know, they own a junkyard, they own, you know, the, the garbage trucks and all that. Whereas they may be wealthy, they also might not be seen as equal in class to people that are maybe not even as wealthy as they are. Um, because they don't they don't have the right they don't drive the right car they don't have the right clothes they don't go to the right restaurants or whatever um, and so again I don't think that they're not it's not unrelated to to you know the economic um, aspect of class uh, but it is at least to some degree distinct but isn't I mean that is it it was never one of the poor people living in a trailer wearing hand-me-downs that were setting the trends though it, it was always the the richer more well-off more popular people who were setting the trends and we just learned to emulate no that's them. true what i'm saying is it's not it's not only because you're rich doesn't necessarily mean you're part of that class Again, there, there are people that are wealthy right, that yeah. aren't part of that class. Um, and Brandon, I, I wanted you to, because you had sort of, the one you posted, that, that first one you were talking about, because I have a little bit of a quibble with that, but I was wondering if you'd talk about that. Uh, I'll just read it. Uh, it's by a guy named Alan McSimeon. Uh, it's from the Anarchist Library. It's called Thinking About Anarchism. And in the book, it's, a, it's an entire book, if I remember it. But he says, classes are defined by their relationship to the means of production. Their relationship to the factories, machinery, natural resources, etc., with which the wealth of society is created. Although these are groups such as the self-employed and the small farmers, the main classes are the workers and the bosses. It is the labor of the working class that creates the wealth. The bosses, through their ownership and control of the means of production, have legal ownership of this wealth and decide how it is to be distributed. Yeah, that's the one I had a little bit. Of, I, I agree with it, the sort of the thought behind it, but I do have I, I sort of disagree with the binary aspect of it. So when I was reading it, I sort of thought in my mind, I think there's really more like four sort of classes um, because the the bosses is is a little reductionist because there is a big difference between the the owner class and the management class. Because the owner class is the one that actually owns things. And the management class is the class that basically is there to make just enough money to defend uh, the owner class. But they are definitely right. not the same thing. But that's that's where the term class trader comes in. You couldn't be a class trader if you weren't part of that working class. And then the other one would be, and I think this is one that maybe gets left. So then obviously you have the working class, which is you know the vast, vast majority of any population of any country um but then the other one that i think maybe is not talked about as much but is the the sort of the non-working poor this is people who are either retired or have been injured or un and are unable to work and who might perhaps not have the means um to even enter the working class uh, i don't know jim what do you think um so i think the breakdowns of who perceives their economic interest and uh, how the, the class structure gets defended is messed up, uh, fascinating, perplexing, because um, like you were saying, the management class uh, largely defends the existing structure, um, partly because I think they have a vested interest in it, uh, and partly because I think um, a lot of us have bought into the mythology that um, meritocracy rules the land. And if you work hard, you're going to move way up. Um, and I also think part of it is that there's really not an appreciation of how far the gap is 
now between being management class, being upper middle class, being uh, uh, a doctor, being a lawyer, uh, uh, being a, I don't know, CPA, what have you, and the owner class. Like, you know, 50 years ago, that gap was big, and now it's inconceivable. Um, Brandon, were you, I think it was you that sent around the app show the wealth of Jeff Bezos, and it just, it's yeah. flabbergasting. I mean, you know, and yeah, average, you just <laughs> kind of like a, a, a little tiny dot and then you're scrolling 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 and like after three minutes a scrolling of a huge block of jeff bezos's wealth like i gave up <laughs> it's it's not even close to the same scale like i, I don't even know how you wrap your head around um two two thing. brief points i should mention uh brennan just got a new puppy uh, and he's having to sort of uh pull a little bit double duty so we're, we're going to be very forgiving of him because puppy is the greatest thing on earth. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, and, and Kale and Brennan can testify to this. Uh, I will often enjoy doing uh, the little uh, uh, comparisons of exactly how much wealth somebody like Jeff Bezos has. I think actually Elon Musk might've uh, aced him out a little bit, but uh, one of the last ones I picked it is that if you printed his money out in $20 bills, it would weigh the same as two battleships. Um. It's uh, it's incredible. Uh, Kale, we've sort of I feel like we kind of skipped over you. What, what, what do you think? What what do you think of uh, of this like stratification? Well, specifically the idea of of workers versus bosses versus uh, workers, managers and and owners. Uh, I mean, I think that's I think that's an important distinction because I feel like management yes, is basically jellyfish, um, and management would side with workers over owners if they were sufficiently uh, motivated through fear of the workers. I feel like you guys are hitting on a lot of uh, things that I wanted to bring to the discussion here. And I feel like specifically uh, Jim and I are kind of on the same wavelength here because um, I'm agreeing with a lot of the things that he's pointing out. Uh, I, did, I wanted to say more directly though, as far as your, uh, your breakdown of, of the class scale, I, I came to the idea uh, of six major sections of class uh, divided by the wealth um, specifically. And I actually came up with a seventh one of my own because it's not even mentioned. Uh, but the, the top of it is the capitalist class or the owner class. Um, and then, as you guys said, there's the upper middle class, that's your your bosses, your managers, the people that are still probably making millions of dollars a year. Um, and so they're telling you that, you know, look at me, you can be me too, and then I'm going to be that guy, and so on and so forth. Then there's the middle middle class, which... Uh, and it, I, if I can give you some numbers here, capitalist class breaks down to basically anybody that makes a half a million dollars or more a year, which there's probably quite a few of them. Um, and then uh, the upper middle class makes about $76,000 a year or more. Uh, the middle class is about $61,000 a year or more. The lower middle class, which most people probably think they're lower to middle uh, mid class. And, but the lower middle class starts at about $46,000 a year. And that's a side point that we'll loop back around to is that the idea of how many Americans think they're middle class, but they're not middle class because they don't understand the definitions of class. Um, and then like uh, you mentioned before, there's the working poor, which I will say I grew up uh, the first 20 years of my life. The bulk of those years was lived in a trailer. Um, I am a member of the working poor. Um, and so that's anything between 19,000 to the 46,000 minimum range of the lower middle class. And then as you said, the underclass, they defined it uh, as the people who are unable to work because of disabilities or, or something like that. So they probably only make maybe $9,000 a year and they're not really making that money. That's just the minimum they can throw at them to keep them alive 
basically, because there's no system to take care of those people. Uh, but the one class that they don't mention is the people like Bezos and Elon Musk. And I have decided to call that the hyper wealthy um, people that have hundreds of billions of dollars. And you're just hoarding all that wealth to one person. And it's not like there's thousands of hyper wealthy people in the world. There's like a handful. I think it's like there's five people that you can name that have uh, most of the world's wealth uh, as as far as economy goes. Um, but uh, something to, to really think about, though, is the the judgment of the lower class people they're like, oh, you're you're lower class. You don't, you know, you're not providing to society. You don't you don't wear the right clothes. You don't drive the right car. You don't you don't go to the clubs or whatever. And uh, you know, it's all those people, the the working poor, and the underclass, and and then the other people who have gone to the streets or or whatever has happened to them. Uh, you know, they're judged in, in a different light because they don't project themselves as these successful people because they're just barely scraping by. Um, I just want to say, first of all, as an absolute rule on this show, that puppies are always and will always be welcome on this show. That is a that is an unchangeable rule. Um, Kale, I, I sort of agree and disagree with you at the same time. I, I agree with you sort of in your basic, what you're basically saying. I disagree with the idea of putting numbers on it um, because numbers are so weird as far as it depends on where you live. It depends on whether or not you're single or have a family. Um, and I mean, th there are people that are that are making maybe only a million dollars a year, which, you know, I say only a million dollars a year that could be considered as part of the owner class. Um and there are people that make two hundred and fifty or three hundred thousand dollars a year that I would consider to be, you know, depending on their living situation, that might be really not have much in the way of disposable income at all. Um, so I don't, I don't agree with the idea of saying, you know, if you make this much, then you're in this class because I think that's that's um, sort of deceptive. I, Brandon, I, I think you're a lot closer blur. to the, I think you're a lot closer to the mark when we talk about sort of your connection with. Uh, control of the means of production like where are you yeah. where how much how much of the means of what what percentage of of uh means of production do you control uh for better or worse yeah i i think you can't really uh i can't i don't know if you can really say that if you don't own the means of production you're not a capitalist you may be a capitalist supporter but i don't think you can be a capitalist without owning the means of production so I think the way I would, I don't know that I ever put it to words, but uh, when I hear means of production uh, controlling it, I feel like what we're really talking about is somebody that's in a position to take advantage of um, other classes of people to create stolen wages essentially yeah um right essentially to to uh to exploit workers to pay them less than the value they put into the company and to take that value for your own profit right and there i mean there could be people that work that are earning a hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars that are would still be that, that could still doing be doing that so doing that solely by themselves and they aren't doing that by employing 10 people on minimum wage and having them uh mostly survive by uh living on government assistance right yeah if you're one of those rare people like say an artist or a mus musician or something one of those rare people that haven't exploited anybody I don't know that those people exist. That might just be, you know, kind of uh, a legend. But, you know, if there is somebody that just entirely on their own talent made their own million dollars and didn't hire another employee or anything at ever time, fine. That's It isn't specifically the amount of money they have that bothers right. me. 
The yeah. other, uh, Brandon, the other thing I wanted to ask you and, and just kind of your take on um, is the idea that, um, especially given how complicated our economic system is uh, in this day and age, many people, not all people by any means, but a lot of people will fall into or could fall into multiple groups. Um, like, for example, somebody that owns their own business and has a, a day job or, um, or, for example, like somebody like me, I'm, I'm a work a day worker but I own stock. Um, and so technically that means I am in a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. I am part of the owner class. Um, that is such a tiny, tiny bit of the owner class that you could not see it without a microscope. Um, but technically, yeah, I, I do own, I own a part of American express and I own a part of, of, you know, a bunch of different companies. Again, it's a microscopic portion. Um, so how do you think of people that, that sort of in different aspects of their life, maybe fall into different, into different classes? Um, I don't know. There's life is kind of a gray continuum. You know, if you were to try and follow, uh, you know, there was, you know, I, I've heard this argument when people were talking about um, uh, evolution deniers there was never a time where an Italian parent gave birth to an entirely Spanish speaking baby. That's, it's not a thing. They're, they're just evolved over time and you could never point to one person that had, you know, that was entirely Spanish or entirely Italian in between there is just how language evolved. And I think that's probably the same here. There's going to be people who will take advantage of opportunities like buying stock but I think that's almost more, it, it, it's one of those things that the, the uh, class in America that the, the ruling class can kind of point to and say, look, anybody can do it. You can, you know, join us up here in the wealthy, even though you're more likely to get struck by lightning, it's it's meant to keep us from like a, a caste system. We would have something to rebel against. We'd have some walls, some boundaries to push against, but with a, with a class system, the way we have it, there's just nothing there. You, there's nothing you can concretely say, Oh, I, this is what we have to fight against because somebody will always be able to point to John Smith, who is now a millionaire or, you know, owns 50 shares of stock in AT&T or whatever. I mean, there's always going to be those little things. I, I, three of my friends in the little town I live with just opened their own shop where they uh, sell their own artwork. It, it's entirely them. They, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how they divide up the profits or anything, but it's entirely up to them. And as long as they're happy, that's fine. They haven't hired anybody else. It's a, a husband, a wife and uh, his sister. And, they seem good with that. I'm, I'm okay with that. I guess technically they are the owners of the means of production, maybe a capitalist class, but they haven't exploited anybody yet. So maybe it's the, uh, not only the, the owning of the means of the production, it's the subsequent exploitation of a worker that uh, defines it. Can I jump in here real quick? No. Because you... That, that's a good lead in for, for something that I wanted to add. Uh, you talked about uh, equal opportunity for everyone. This is uh, your chance to make it big. Everybody gets to uh, attempt to climb the ladder. Uh, and that's because we live in a meritocratic achievement based system. Um, but then that doesn't really well, we think we do, but we don't. Your equal opportunity does not necessarily mean you're going to get an equal outcome. And uh, let's talk about things like family fortunes and things like that. Um, so that's a good point, Kev. So one of the things, and if you're ever talking to somebody who is defending the current capitalist system, the first thing they will always point to is how many, quote unquote, self-made millionaires there are in this country that is the biggest bunch of horse shit on earth um if you don't understand how so remember uh, what, what that means is that means their money is not inherited um but if you don't understand how just being the child of somebody who has 500 million dollars 
could very easily become a millionaire on their own without an inheritance, then you don't really understand how this system works. Um, yeah. By that, by that definition, the Kardashians are all self-made millionaires. Um, many, many people are self-made millionaires. Uh, uh, Donald Trump was, until his father died, a self-made millionaire. Um, it is a BS term. It is a term used uh, because it makes it sound like we have a very, you know, sort of fair uh, economic system, and we do not. Um, the people that are getting most of the money uh, are either themselves rich or their parents were rich. Whether or not their parents left them a bunch of money or not is incidental. Um, they were in a position um, where they could make a bunch of money. I mean, uh, the one, so my wife and I, we, we went up to my brother-in-law's place uh, for uh, New Year's. Um, and on the way up and on the way back, we were listening to this podcast about the Theranos thing. I'm not, is everybody familiar with the, the Theranos, you know, debacle? Um, essentially, it's this woman who was going to invent so. this brand new technology where you could do any blood test with one drop of blood, and it was going to revolutionize the whole medical industry. Um, the only flaw in that plan is they had no such technology and none of it ever worked. Um, no, but she is. came from wealth, and so she was able to con a bunch of people into giving her a bunch of money. Now, if she was a good con man and came from, uh, you know, a poor household, she still might have made some money, but she definitely would not have been in the room with Henry Kissinger um, and, you know, these other incredibly wealthy and well-connected government officials. She was able to do that because her family was rich. Um, and so the, the myth of the self-made millionaire is something that uh, will be pointed out to you over and over and over again by, you know, the, the right wing and the, the sort of defenders of the upper class. And it is bullshit from uh, the word go. Uh, Jim, what, go ahead. So on this point, there's a couple of things that I pop into my head that I think are relevant. One is, um, I think I have read, and it's been a long time, that one of the biggest determinants of a person's future earnings are what neighborhood they grew up in, what the neighbors yeah. make. Yeah, your zip code's a big deal. Right. Um, the other one that I wanted to bring up is uh, an experiment, a psychological experiment where they played the game of Monopoly. And when they did the experiment, they gave some players like $1,000 or $10,000 to start the game. They gave them a financial advantage. And um, they found that during the game that the people that had the financial advantage, would, they did not do anything to earn, right? They just got it. We're taunting the other players like and at the end of the game, they felt like they won fair and square that they did it by the sweat of their brow, even though, you know, they clearly had an unearned financial advantage to start the game, um, which I think just think is fascinating that uh, and people think we don't have myths like the Greeks did. Right. We have so many stories we tell ourselves that are just I mean nothing to do with reality imagine like redlining practices on monopoly not only do you get to start off with ten thousand dollars but Brandon, you, should, you should explain color, you should explain what redlining is real quick because there's definitely people that don't know what that is well uh, just briefly I, I can't tell you an actual timeline back back shortly after uh jim crow there was uh uh, redlining practices where you just like banks wouldn't give loans to people of color if in uh, certain like areas zip codes and stuff like that they just they just wouldn't allow them to buy houses in those areas right i mean it wasn't just banks like real estate agents wouldn't show them yeah yeah, yeah yeah and it, it wasn't like they were uh like this is why sometimes when people say, oh, there's no such thing as systemic racism, what they're saying is that there's no law specifically saying you black person cannot do X. But that doesn't have to be. That's it's it's again why it's the same thing as this uh, class versus caste thing. They don't want to give us a defined, clear boundary. It's why I don't think the the whole. Um, uh, uh, handmaid's tale thing would actually happen because then you have something to fight against you have a face to the to the bad guys 
you have a goal, you have, you know, someone you could go push against, you could throw rocks at or whatever. I mean, there's, there's, they're never going to give us something that clearly defined. And why would they? It's already working. I mean, all these conspiracy theories are like, so they can get more money. In power. They already have all that. They have all the money and power. Their only fear now is an uprising. So they need us to think that there is a chance at mobility, that anyone can do it, and that you know this American dream is a real thing. They need us to keep thinking that. The moment we stop thinking that, then there might be one of those actual bad guys, you know, you know, like an an actual emperor you could see and point to as you know the big bad. But until then, as long as they've got most people comfortable and mostly bamboozled, then that's not going to change. And most people really aren't as comfortable as they could be. They just think they are. Like if if you have to spend over 50 60 70 percent on rent if you're not as comfortable as you could be you've just gotten used to it well i think that uh yeah that's true i think i think that the best uh trick that the upper class ever played was uh keeping up the illusion that they hadn't already won the class war 50 years ago or 100 yeah. years ago or yeah, a long time ago, ago. I mean, um, back when feudalism, that they just kind of went with the change to capitalism. It was fine. They had control right from the beginning. Yeah. it's. A, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it's just, you know, that shock doctrine book we've talked about before, that when there's a moment of crisis, you steer the way you want it to go once everything settles back down. And it's, it's just na- the- just a natural thing for people in power to do. They want to remain in power. They're not in smoke-filled rooms coming up with devious plans that they encode on their skin or something. It's just, you know, they want to maintain homeostasis. They want to make sure they still have wealth and privilege. And if there's a crisis and they can get something more out of us, they'll just do that. Yeah, uh, Kale, I'm going to go to you just one second. But yeah, uh, I mean, I've said for a very long time, um, the, the conspiracy theories that say the rich want this, that, or the other thing, what the rich want more than anything else, what the establishment in this country wants more than anything else is for everything to basically continue exactly as it is right now. Because they've won. They've won. They, they have all the cards. And right now, all they're doing is taking a tiny little bit more uh, from workers in this country every year, just taking a little bit more every year. Uh, and as George Carlin said, the next thing they're going to come for is your social security. So wait for that. Anyway, Kale, I'm sorry. You go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just going to say you brought up uh, the handmaid's tale. And that reminded me another one of uh, the things I wanted to talk about uh, was class judgment and class warfare specifically, I think, uh, in the book, My Fair Lady, about two basically capitalist class who uh, basically make a wager on on a worker class woman uh, who one guy just expands her vocabulary and uh, gives her the the big words um, and how people are judged for that. And like, if you speak in a particular way that people will think that you are of a higher class if you can convince them. And it's kind of bleeding into the uh, the the gal that did the blood test thing that didn't work and lowered her voice real low. The th- I can't remember. Theranos. Her name escapes me right off the top of my head. But I, yeah, the Theranos lady. It's uh, it's something. Um, Jim, where, where are you at? Uh, so I kind of wanted to circle back around to cast. Um, and how that plays into it. So for me, I feel like caste just adds another dimension to class in our country that there are classes, but there's also separate lanes depending on what caste you fall into. So I think for me, it seems like there's a quote, white class and it changes who's in the white class over time. Like there was a time that Italians were not white. Irish yeah. were not white. Uh, and it, even though like they're super white, would, just like objectively. Right. 
Uh, don't get much now, whiter than the Irish. And now I feel like, you know, maybe Asians are kind of considered white in that lane. Um, and the people that aren't white are in a whole separate lane. And you can move up whether you're in the white lane or the non-white lane, but it's but you not move comparable. Lane. You have to stay in your lane. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, well, Kale, you had mentioned, I think, at the beginning, the idea of them not including race as a part of class. But I think if you've lived in this country for longer than five seconds, you know that race is an integral part of class, that that the idea, you know, you, you can be you know, successful possibly, but, but, you know, uh, race is going to be used as a way to keep you in a certain class. You, you're not going to be a part a of a class because you, because of your race, but they will definitely try to say, well, if you're this, then you must be this kind of a, kind of a situation. So uh, while race is not directly a class, although I think you could certainly make that argument, um, it is certainly an excuse to put people into a certain class. I think that as an academic, you could argue that you're not going to use race or ethnicity or anything like that. But real world application, it's always going to be an issue. Brandon, what do well, you think of the idea of the connection between race and class? Yeah, um, I think that's you know, the term itself, I think, refers to a, a an actual academic field of study, intersectionality. I, I think it's an actual thing you study, and I have never done that. So grain of salt. But I think that's one of the things they mean by intersectionality is the the uh, I, as not a rich person, have certain uh, things that I can't do because I don't have the money for them. Like my, my representative isn't going to listen to me. They don't care. But somebody who is at the exact same economic position with me, but who is also a person of color is going to have another thing put on top of them. Like traditionally in um, uh, job applications, people with less white sounding names experience more rejection of their job applications. And then if you were, say, a person of color who is also a transgender person of color, you have yet another system of oppression and uh, uh, degradation and, and just people putting their own expectations on you right on top of that. So it, it just yeah it just keeps layering and layering and layering. So. Well, I know somebody at work who said there's no such thing as white privilege. Well, there is. And it's not that you if you're a per poor person or have had trials and tribulations, you know, you've you even if you've been homeless or whatever. That's not to diminish those problems, but other people who were also black and gay or or a woman or something like that have extra added problems weighing them down so i think when we talk about class and race they are two separate issues but they are very much part they're they're chains hooked to the same post yeah, yeah i mean it's one of those things I, want, I think i think that uh and I, I think someday we should do a show just on on political communication, because I think political communication is incredibly interesting. And in what do we call things? I think the idea of calling like I think the term privilege is something that, that just it didn't it doesn't it doesn't focus group very well, um, even though if you when you describe it, and you talk about what it is. It's something that's plain to anybody. You know, it, it, I mean, if you are, uh, you know, coming back from the war in the 1940s, uh, uh, which, you know, um, Bill O'Reilly always talks about his father um, and how they got this this house in in uh, in this specific area um, and and, you know, them doing this. And that's how he was able to get the education, do all these things he needed. Well, black people couldn't buy houses there. Um, and so it would be very tough for them to have these advantages when they couldn't even buy houses there. And we um, don't qualify for the GI Bill either. Right. Wouldn't qualify the GI Bill. And, and yeah, all this stuff. Um, and uh, so I, I think that it's one of those things that the, the communication of it gets interesting where um, when people hear privilege, they think, well, I'm, you know, I grew up poor in a trailer somewhere 
and what what privilege that I have. And I think it's we need to find a better word for it that that people are able to sort of grapple onto more. Um, but again, it's it's one of those things. If you explain it to anybody, they understand. It's like if if somebody had the same experience you did, but they were black, their life would have been tougher. You know, if they had if it, it, exact same position, you. I mean, the, the the study I always remember is they did a study on eBay, and items that were being held in a black hand versus a white hand would sell for less. I mean, it's literally to that degree. Same description, uh, same user feedback, same everything. Um, and literally just because there is a black hand holding the iPhone versus a white hand holding the iPhone, um, it sells for less. So, I mean, to, to sort of get back on, on class specifically, clearly uh, race and class are related. Um, whether or not it's a separate lane, like Jim was talking about, or whether or not uh, in, increasing your sort of your class statistic, you know, going from, you know, class A to class B or whatever, class B to class whatever, um, is certainly more difficult if you're black or if you're a woman or if you're a black woman or if you're a black gay woman or whatever. It, it's a different experience. Uh, it, it is not the same level of work um, to do that as it would be if you were, you know, a straight white dude. And we know because we're, you know, four straight white dudes. So <laughs> I, I, that's the, for me, that's the biggest challenge with white privilege is, uh, excuse my dog. Um, that right, as white right. people, we don't, we don't experience it. And so a lot of people think that it's garbage because, well, I don't see racism. Well, yeah, maybe you don't see racism because you're white. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but that's not people's experience. And so it would be like me walking in being like, Hey, I've never been denied a job because I'm black. And it's like, well, yeah, you, you wouldn't because you're not, not. <laughs> like, right. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's, it, it's, well, and I think we, it's complicated. It is, it is complicated how race and class fit in because obviously and, there are very prominent upper class black people and Latino people and, and women and, and, you know, especially like uh, gay men, for example, I mean, uh, gay men are, are as, as a sort of, as a group of people relatively affluent. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's, that's one of the reasons I kind of wanted to have this episode. And I feel like we all should kind of admit to some degree, like none of us have the absolute answers to any of this. Um, and that's why I kind of wanted to have this discussion more than anything else. Cause I feel like sometimes in having these kind of discussions, you sort of come up with the realizations and you, and you think about things in a way that you wouldn't, because you're, you know, you're talking to other people and like, you know, I mean, we're, four white dudes from Iowa and we don't think about things in entirely the same way. So, you know, it, it shows you that, that being exposed to any kind of, of diversity of thought is, is a good thing. And that's why I think these kind of discussions are so important. I think one of the nice things about being in Iowa is that you have less of a chance of running into a racist. Uh, and <laughs> if you not. do, they're, they're usually really subtle about it. Um, we don't, re and, but there's another, demo there's other demographics out there, like uh, heavy people get discrimi discriminated against too. Yeah. Uh, just, Fetch you know, it's that, that, that judging culture of, oh, what are you doing here? You don't, you don't fit in here, like literally. Well, I, by the way, I would disagree by the, about the subtlety of racism in Iowa, because I've lived in Iowa my whole life, and oftentimes the racism has not been remotely subtle. Um, I mean, sometimes it's subtle. In, in Iowa, we are very, I don't know, we, we should do a, a, just a psychology of Iowans show, because I think that's kind of an interesting thing. But like we, there is, there is definitely a lot of subtle racism, but then I think there's also a lot of rather unsubtle racism too. Well, and we internalize the narratives that fit our own story. So, I mean, we, we don't want to think that we got here like you know this high idea of somebody being born into privilege and just handed something offends a lot of uh old time you know working class people 
though now that's becoming a, a thing that's not that big a deal. I mean, there's so many people that have decided that Donald Trump's the working class savior here when his hands are as smooth as the day he was born. He's never done a day's worth of work in his life. And he poops on a golden toilet. I yeah, to yeah. if you have a golden that. toilet, you're just out. You, right. To be fair, Jim, he poops classroom. in a golden toilet. Yeah. Uh, well, that's um, with him, that's not that entirely that. for sure. What about By the way, Brandon, you mentioned redlining earlier, and one of the most famous examples of redlining was Fred Trump, which is where Donald Trump got oh, yeah. you know, all of yeah, his yeah. money from. Um, I mean, there's reports that Fred Trump went to Klan rallies. So, again, sometimes the racism subtle, sometimes it's not. <laughs> well, well, I guess that's where I was getting at, though. Um, I think it's the same reason that people support cops and all that, even though, you know, we're supposed to be a country that was uh, founded on rebellion and overthrowing our leaders, but we keep like support blue lives type. It's like, no man. Yeah. They're from our neighborhoods, but they're enforcing the rules that are making our lives worse, that are keeping us exploited, that are keeping us from a better life they are the class traitors that's that's what that term means they are still part of our class but they are enforcing the ruling classes standards and ethos and 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 the narrative and we glorify them on tv and sorry what you ever try to do you ever try to talk to them to to negotiate with them to to spread your idea to see how they feel about with the it. cop no as an individual Although, not it, brandon and kale specifically I, i'm interested to see and this is maybe a little outside of the bounds but i it, may, maybe not to some degree um the experience of like small town cops in from you guys i think is is well at least in your hometown it is relatively positive um growing up because it was I mean, the idea of a police officer is a good thing. The idea of somebody who is trying to maintain just, you know, civility, maintain order, maintain, you know, not people hitting each other in the streets for no reason. Uh, I think the idea of that's a good thing. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't really worked out that well <laughs> in practice. Um, and, you know, the idea, I mean, I here, sort of my prototypical example of a police officer interaction in like a small town is two guys coming outside of a bar and like yelling at each other and fighting them or trying to fight each other. And what a good cop would do is to come up and try and like de-escalate the situation, get people to calm down and just go home. Um, and that is sort of in a small town, again, assuming both participants are white, um, you would see that. I think you'd see that a lot. You'd see a lot of cops where it's just like, hey, hey, cut the shit, go home, you know, cut the shit. And, and, and you would see that. Whereas now you have this militarism in police, which again, we're, I'm almost certainly going to do a show on police militarism. Um, but yeah, it really does get into the police as sort of class enforcers, this idea that, you know, I mean, like take, for example, somebody who uh, robs a convenience store for $300 you know, that person is going to get thrown on the ground. Um, maybe some of their teeth knocked out by the police officer when they arrest them. Um, but Bernie Madoff steals an untold amount of money. And I'm guessing his arrest was incredibly civil. Um, yeah. And so it shows you what the police value. The police value the idea of, of protection. And, and Bernie Madoff isn't even a great example because Bernie Madoff was stealing from rich people. Um, but, uh, you know... Like, I don't think when, uh, when, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, I can't think of her name, uh, uh, Martha Stewart, when Martha Stewart went to jail for insider trading, I doubt they kicked in her front door, um, and shot her dog and hauled her off to prison by her hair. No, that's not what happened. Um, well, and- but she stole, but she, but she made a tremendous amount more than somebody who br- they, they kicked in their door because they had, you know, two pounds of marijuana or a pound of marijuana or 16 ounces of marijuana and well, they, they kicked in their they door and did all these things and george and yes Floyd i'm was clearly executed. old because i said marijuana and not weed or pot or whatever the fuck the kids call it these days when george floyd was executed for having maybe a fake 20 dollar bill whereas 
Brock Turner got released from raping someone because it would ruin his future. Brandon, that's up here. He got six months of probation. That's a rough mm-hmm. sentence right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really- that's, that's, that's actually, a, 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 we've sort of stumbled into it, but I think a really important, another really important aspect of class is uh, the, the relationship between law enforcement and class and how, well, but that's the same thing for me with the boss. Uh, my immediate supervisor does not own the means of production, but he enforces the people who's, who do own it. He enforces their rules and regulations. And that was your point about the police as well, right? Yes. Yes, it was. So then what, what class would you, would you put him in the workers class or the, or the, he is still a worker. Yes. Yeah. He is still working class because he doesn't own those means of production. He doesn't much like me. He doesn't have the ability to just not go to work today. He doesn't have the ability to go on, you know, a cane coon cruise at the drop of a hat, which again, isn't money. It's the ability to just not go to work whenever you want to. You don't have anybody you need to say, Oh, I'm not coming into because there's going to be workers there that are making you money while you do nothing. I believe Ted Cruz has those booked right now. So there's not any available. In both both of those occupations, you will hear eventually somebody say, I don't make the rules. I just enforce them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah actually, that's a that's a really good point, and that's interesting. The idea of the rules, um, yeah, and the rules, the 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 primacy of the rules, um, and the idea that well, you know, uh, and, and there was a case that uh, I think it was Gorsuch or uh, his cap. No, I think it was Gorsuch uh, ruled on before he's a judge that I, I heard a lot about where uh, this truck driver had left his truck because it had run out of gas. Um, and the company had told him he had to stay in the truck, even though if he had stayed in the truck, he would have frozen to death. And they ruled in favor of the company and said, no, um, the rules say this. And it's like, but if the rules aren't protecting human beings, then they're not good rules and we shouldn't obey them. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, we should, oh, this whole system, everything we have, whether it's the economic system, the political system, the social system, um, it should be there to serve the people. Uh, it, sh- it should be there to make the lives of human beings better than it was yesterday. Um, and if, it, well, and if it's what, not doing well, those things, then it, it, if it's not doing those things, then they shouldn't exist. When, when rules are made, it is undoubtedly a bunch of people sitting in a room coming up with them. If we all sat down in a room and came up with contrary rules, who would, whose rules would be enforced and what would be the difference? The difference would be who owns the means of production. And of course, they used money they got from exploiting people. So it's not, it's ill-gotten gains in the first place. They use money from exploiting people to buy the means of production and then pay off the enforcers of their own rules. Um, yeah. I, I have an aside on rules and uh, this doesn't have anything to do with- class. What are you, a lawyer or something? I am. Uh, actually, I got this from a crazy, super religious parenting class, but it's something that really, <laughs> it, it stayed with me. Um, there's a difference between rules and principle. And uh, I mean, from parenting, it's very important, but I, I think it's a general life lesson that you need to be making decisions based on principles, not on rules. And the rules are okay but you can't elevate the rules above the principle that the rules are supposed to represent. So the rules are just supposed to be uh, a simplification, codification uh, of some sort of principle. But like the truck driver example, if it leads to an absurd result or it violates the principle that the rules are supposed to represent, then it's not a good rule and you should be following the principle, not the rule. But what if it doesn't actually violate the secret principle that, which is right. Keep making us money. Yeah. I mean, do as we say, I I think it would be the entire idea of insubordination gives me the heebie jeebies, but. Brandon, I was trying to talk and that was very insubordinate of you to try to talk while I was talking. (laughs) I know. Um, No, I thought it'd be interesting, especially with Jim to talk about, because the, the thing that, that has bothered me a lot, I, there's another YouTube channel that I, I like a lot called Legal Eagle that does a lot of 
you know, um, uh, breakdowns of, of various law cases and things like this, um, and whether or not we have a justice system. Um, and this is not from him. This is this is my sort of, you know, socialist, crazy lefty take that we don't really have a justice system um, because the justice system doesn't really value the things that I think you should value. Um, and that is to say uh, us, you know, human beings. It, it doesn't I, I think it values sort of the rules over the people. I mean, the people are the principle. You know, making a world that is better for people is the principle that that should be how you judge a justice system doesn't make life better for people or worse for people. And if a justice system is making life worse for people, then you can't call it a justice system. It's just a system. (laughs) And and when Mitt Romney insists that corporations are people, I wonder if that isn't so they can say, oh, it does benefit the people. The and by the way, that was in Iowa care that care. he said that. And uh, it was. the the organization my wife worked for was was uh, the one that got him to say that. So we do good things in Iowa too sometimes. <laughs> when, when's the last time a corporation went to jail? Right? Well, you know, it's yeah. funny. So uh, did you guys watch, and this is sort of tangentially related to class. Did you guys watch the uh, uh, Dope Sick, the, the Hulu show? Hmm. Highly recommend it. It's, it's sort of about the... You know the Sacklers and Purdue Pharma and the the uh, um, um, the opioid crisis. You know the creation of OxyContin uh, and uh, basically the, the where they were prescribing OxyContin for for uh, chronic pain. Which any doctor right. will tell you that prescribing OxyContin for chronic pain is insane because it's an opioid and it's addictive, highly addictive. Um, you don't prescribe somebody opium for long term pain. You know it's for it's meant to be I for just. Uncle. Right, who was addicted to and it destroyed him. He turned gray and he wasted away, and he's finally getting over it now. But he'll never be the same. It destroyed him. Yeah, it's it's, it's horrible, horrible stuff. But it shows you that you know they were able to. Uh, so th- they found the corporation to be liable for this stuff. But unfortunately, you can't send corporations to prison. Um, And so the corporation was hurt very badly. Unfortunately, the corporation isn't fucking real. The people were real. And the Sacklers who own the corporation walked away with a ton of money. Even after they were they were they were found to be liable for it. They were selling this product, knowing that it was addictive to people and knowing that it would destroy people's lives. And they didn't care. And they had a couple of executives plead to uh, 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 misdemeanor charges for which I don't even think they ever served a day. And they might've served a day or two in prison. I don't know, but served no serious time. Uh, the corporation was harshly punished, but unfortunately none of the fucking people were. Yep. And you know what that helps that helps those lawyers that you see on those commercials are like, have you suffered blah, blah, blah from blah, 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 then call blah, blah, blah. And then those lawyers, sorry, Jim, those <laughs> lawyers get like a thousand people that were affected by something that some company did. Be careful which side you're on this, Kale, because the people you're describing are lawyers that are getting money from corporations. So so I, I do have something to say about and By this. the way, you're talking uh, about Bob Loblaw from uh, 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 Arrested Development. Um, I think it's really interesting that... Uh, a lot of when I do hear politicians complaining about uh, ambulance chasers and litigious attorneys causing all sorts of problems, they're the same people that say federal government can't regulate things. The market's going to correct for it. Well, how does the market correct for my kid died because you made a faulty product or my uncle died because you were pushing something that you know is addictive? And, and then they'll say, oh, well, you know. We should have restrictions on how much damages people should get, who can sue for what, what kind of, uh, uh, where they can sue people. Um, and at the same time, they're also saying the government shouldn't regulate any of this. Talk about internalizing a narrative. That's insane. I mean, you should definitely be able to sue a company for as much as you, for far beyond what they considered when they made, when they it's broke called, it's, the rule. It's called punitive damages. Yeah. And, you know, you should be anytime you see somebody uh, talking about tort reform, um, what they're doing is they're saying corporations shouldn't have to pay more money. 
Um, right. And as far as the lawyers, you know, it's it's one of those things. What, what did uh, Danny DeVito say in other people's money? Lawyers are like nuclear weapons. They have ours, theirs, so we have to have ours. Um, and uh, Jim, I'll tell you off camera my favorite lawyer joke because it definitely doesn't play well on YouTube. All right. Um, but no, I, I mean, those lawyers are great. I mean, for example, well, I don't want to get into my personal stuff, but, you know, uh, lawyers do a lot of good things. I mean, lawyer, lawyer I mean, uh, uh, one of my wife's best friends is a, is a, is a uh, I don't know exactly what his title is, but he, he does like uh, social justice law. Um, and, and I mean, so there are a lot of terrible lawyers out there and there are a lot of lawyers that are doing a lot of really great things. So I'd be really careful when you, when you go after lawyers, because some of them are doing some great stuff. And when you see people that hate most... lawyers, the reason is, is they've been taken in by this whole tort reform thing. And the idea that all oh, lawyers are just getting a big payday off of this. And some of them are, it's true. Some of them are making a bunch of money off of this, but also some of them are making a bunch of money for their clients from a corporation that has really messed them up. Generally speaking, though, I just want, you know, I, I was particularly talking about a, a certain group of lawyers and their settlement lawyers. Uh, I would think that that's what they are. And um, they're very upfront, though. They're like, look, we're, this is, you know, our fee. We're going to get this percentage or whatever. And we're going to get you some money. Uh, so, I mean, you have a right to agree to that or not agree with that. And, and that's fine. But, I mean, they're very upfront about it. So, I mean, at least they're being honest and it's not, and they're not exploiting you because they're telling you, look, I, I need to make money by, and well, I'm I mean, there are lawyers that exploit you. people. Hey, Jim, I don't think that's a controversial statement. There are definitely lawyers out there that exploit people. No, um, I mean, there's a, you know, I think in any sort of situation, there's a power differential. And if, uh, you know, if you have somebody that there's also an information differential. Absolutely. And, and that's the biggest have, thing, I think. If you have a potential client who is desperate for some money of any sort of kind, um, you know, there's definitely attorneys that can take advantage of that and, you know, do the bare minimum, get a quick settlement. They get, you know, a good chunk of it and the client gets some. And, but maybe that wasn't the best result for the client. Well, and it's, it's a more, it fits into a movie easier. It's more tangible to point out than worker exploitation. The worker, I mean, one of the links I posted was to uh, Ohio pizzeria workers get uh, one. They had one day where they just split the total proceeds. You know, they took out a little bit for the business itself. They all agreed on a certain amount. And then they took out and then everybody just got the the total proceeds split. And the employees ended up making $78 an hour that day. Imagine well, how much you're exploited daily. Imagine, because, I mean, that's a pizzeria. So most of those people are probably considered like waitresses and stuff. They're probably not even at the minimum wage. Right. Well, Brandon, one of the other things that you linked that I really liked uh, was the video on uh, Welcome to Class War, which again, all this stuff is going to be linked below. So click yeah. away. Um, and by the way, uh, Brandon was talking about uh, intersectionality. I'm going to, I, we didn't talk about that originally, but intersectionality is actually really interesting and important. Um, I'm going to find a good video about that. This is sort of an intro and I'll put that in the description as well, because intersectionality is really important. Uh, it, it's just basically the idea of sort of how, you know, race, gender, uh, all these things um, affect your experience. It's, it's, it's a really interesting topic. So we'll, we'll link to that. Um, but the, the, the welcome to class where we're sort of breaks down in a, in a very cartoonish way, intentionally cartoonish way, um, how exactly capitalism works. And I think it's one of those things that if you look at the mainstream media and you sort of, I mean, just mainstream culture, um, this idea that, well, I'm going to hire workers so that I can then make more money, um, sort of sounds good until you realize what's actually happening. What you're saying is I am going to hire somebody who I am going to get a hundred dollars worth of labor out of and then pay them $50. Um, that is, and again, if you're a capitalist and you think, Hey, maybe that's okay. That's okay. But you have to admit that is exploitative. Um, and that's why, you know, if you hear me say capitalism inher is inherently exploitative, that's what I'm saying. Um, all capitalism is based on uh, 
uh, managers or owners or a combination of the two uh, trying to get workers to work for less than they can get for their labor. That is why it is inherently exploitative. Uh, I don't know, Brent, do you have any, you, you were the one that liked that. Do you have any thoughts on that one? No, it is. I, it's a very good video, but yeah, no, that's, that's it. Exactly. There's, you know, you, even you had said this uh, a couple of, well, maybe it was the anti-work episode. There's very little you can do to control your own costs. You can renegotiate freight costs here and there and save a little bits. You can renegotiate with the retailers and, you know, maybe talk down your material, your raw material suppliers a little bit here and there, but that stuff is pretty static. It's going to stay that way in, in relative terms, pretty much throughout the life of your business maybe even go up, you know, if you're, if you're dependent on, you know, lithium, you're, you're going to probably support a coup in Bolivia, but um, past well, there's that, also there's going to be a market, there's going to be a market rate for right, the, the, right. the, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever steel is at right now, you're going to pay the market rate. You're not going to pay half the market rate. You're just not. But the, the most flexible thing is your employees. Exactly. And it's the most profitable thing. It's maybe one of the reasons why they haven't gone to full automation yet, because that then becomes a static expense that cannot be exploited. Um, That's sort of an interesting thought. And I, I didn't think about that. The idea that automation is something that so many manufacturers have been working towards and that may be their ultimate undoing because Ultimate automation means that everybody's costs are going to eventually be the same. Um, and you it would eventually level out. Yeah. You can't exploit a machine. It would reach an equilibrium. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's sort of, you know, uh, the idea that something sort of contains the means for its own destruction um, is very kind of poetic. And the idea of the automation is something that the, the capitalists have loved for so long. And that that sort of containing the means for their own destruction is, is I don't know, kind of funny. It might be why they haven't really pulled the trigger on it because they could have. I mean, it, we, we've we been in enough of an automated, I mean, people were talking about automation taking our jobs back during the strikes in the 30s. Um, it very easily in the last 80 years could have been replaced us all, but it hasn't. There well, might be that, just... that might be the reason. Just, just a couple of little tangents that I, I'm kind of interested in. So um, one thing that I've noticed in as far as class in my lifetime, so, you know, uh, my working years started around, you know, the early to mid 90s, early 90s, because um, I'm old. Um, the jobs that used to be uh, what I would consider to be jobs that you were proud to have, you know, a job that, you know, if you were, if you went out to the bar with a bunch of people, um, there are certain jobs that it's like, okay, these are jobs that are sort of quote unquote, okay, or not okay to have. Um, and like when I was a kid, it felt like working at McDonald's was a fine job to have, you know, if, you know, say early mid eighties, like, uh, I, I don't know that people would be particularly embarrassed about working at McDonald's, whereas they've sort of, uh, the way the, the 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 consciousness has worked is like now it's like no if you work at McDonald's you must be stupid or must be bad or something, um, and it feels like they're doing that with more and more professions, um, and it sort of it, it's almost like it's a, a a way to make workers hate ourselves more, which again, surprising I know. Um, so, what are your guys' uh, sort of memories from when you first got into the workforce? you know, your first jobs and your teenagers or, or whatever. Um, uh, well, sorry, go ahead, Jim. Uh, I worked summers for many years detasseling um, corn. Uh, I hope I don't kill it. That go gory details of what that's all about, but it's field labor. And Very common job in Iowa. <laughs> absolutely. And because it was an uh, agricultural job, they didn't have to pay the minimum minimum wage. We had a different minimum minimum wage, which was lower. Um, minimum 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 wage. Right. Uh, luckily, I was able to actually make decent money doing it because a small part of the year was actually when we detested the corn. And that was so economically important that they were willing to pay decent money for it. 
So I actually would work for about six weeks at the minimum minimum wage. And then for about two weeks, I would do the real detasseling and I would make probably two or three times in those two weeks what I did the previous six weeks. Um, and uh, I think my next job, well, I worked food service uh, when I went off to um, school and that was, that was awful. Um, and the next job after that made me go back to detasseling. I worked at a trust factory in West Des Moines working night shift uh, with uh, everybody else that I worked with had substance abuse problems. Um, it was a real eye-opening working experience. Um, it made, you know, doing field work look like that's, that's where it's at. So and Brian, what about you guys? Um, not from my first two jobs. My first job was a volunteer at the home. Uh, uh, and my second job was cleaning our local church. And it, I was the only person there. So there wasn't too much of that. But yeah, I don't know, probably not third, fourth, fourth job, something like that was at uh, a grocery store. And I was always surprised because I always thought it was something that I should be ashamed of that I was at a grocery store and not like, I mean, the, the grind set thing wasn't really a thing in the nineties, but it still felt like I should be attempting to move up. But uh, there's a lot of people that uh, were surprisingly respectful of the grocery store. I worked at at least. So that was kind of odd. I never fully understood why. I mean, I was hey, happy I with a... it. I was glad they weren't mad at me, but, or, you know, looking down at me for it. I have a connection to that, by the way, uh, Brandon. I, so I worked at a uh, a small retailer with a big blue banner that ends in Mart that people have probably heard of. Um, and uh, I remember working there and being kind of ashamed of it because it's like, you know, it's I work at Mart. And uh, I remember seeing a guy that I went to high school with who, uh, you know, may have also had some substance abuse problems. Um, and, uh, you know, he and I were relatively friendly in high school and I being kind of sheepish about, you know, like kind of ashamed of my job, which by the way, if you're working, don't ever be ashamed of your job. Don't ever be ashamed of your job. If you're, if you're working anywhere, whether it's at a job or even in the home, you're taking care of kids, you're cleaning the counter, whatever you're doing, don't be ashamed of what you're doing because you're doing, you're doing work. Um, but anyway, so I remember sort of being a bit sheepish about it and he was like, Hey, at least you got a job. And I was like, yeah, he's right. I do have a job. I'm doing more than some people are doing and, or I'm doing what other people are doing and that's fine. Anyway, sorry, Kale, you go ahead. Uh, well, I got a three part little segment here for you. I'm going to throw right at you. As oh far God, as the job shaming thing, I've, um, I will say that I, uh, also worked at the Mart and, when I did work there, uh, I worked there with my dad uh, because he worked for another company, giant company that makes tires in Iowa that for tractors and stuff. And it starts with a great big red F. And uh, he was a member of a union and the union was on strike. And so for the time being, he was doing other things. And so we worked together at the night shift and we also worked together at a golf course as groundskeepers. And I thought it was awkward to work at the same place that my dad worked at. But now that you bring it up, it makes me wonder how he felt about doing the jobs he was doing after being at a job where he was well-established and, and fairly well paid for for uh the standards of the time uh you know he he was a senior uh person there and so i wonder how that made him feel and i never really asked him that uh as far as my first few jobs like i okay here's a little mini privilege um i worked at a seed company um in the little town next to the little town that i grew up in and um i worked there because i had family members that worked there and friends that worked there so i got uh, a job that 
I may not have, well, probably would not have had if I did not know who I knew. And I know that's a little thing, but as a teenager, it was a pretty big deal to me. And um, after the season was over, I went and worked at the Golden Arches for a while. And I worked my way up and uh, some of the kitchen staff had left and I said that I should be at a certain level, that I should get a certain title um, and a certain rate of pay because I was doing a certain amount of work. And yes, that was it. You got it. And they said um, no. So I was like, F you. And I went back to the seed company. Now, I didn't go back to the same thing I was doing, but I still was pretty comfortable where I was for a season. And then I moved on to other things. Um, But um, I also wanted to segue because I'm not sure how much time we have left in this. And I had like a couple other things I really wanted to touch on. Uh, so me, not can, to, let me let me bust in on my my work experience real quick and I'll throw back to you and go back and just be kind of okay sorry I, I'm OCD I have to keep everything in compartments <laughs> or I'll go crazy um so my experience like I said I, I worked at, at the at the W at the W Mart with the blue and the shitty pay and the everything hey, yeah. um so the one thing there so Brandon, earlier we were talking about sort of management class versus owner class. Um, and the one thing that place had done was it was cutting back on the management class. And it sort of, it, it more goes towards your argument that those people are basically uh, working class that's just been tricked into defending, you know, the, the, the owners. Um, but, you know, you used to have one person who was a department manager over every department. And then you would have somebody that was the department manager over two departments. And then three three departments, and it was just a way to you know cut down on the sort of higher pay jobs. Um, uh, the one thing for me, and this is one thing as far as, as as far as the way you sort of feel emotionally about your job, because I think we all have an emotional reaction to the jobs we work. Uh, I mean, there's jobs I've done that I hated, sort of. I felt bad that I was doing, and I didn't want to do, and I, I thought they were you know jobs that were either beneath me. Uh, either because I'm incredibly arrogant or because they were just really shitty jobs, whatever. Um, but the first time I sort of felt like, and this is, I, I should have asked this more clearly because I think this is more what I was asking about. The first job where I really felt like I was important uh, was when I joined the army. And when I was in the army, I felt like um, the position that I had was a position of importance. Um, people had to ask me things and people had to come to me and say, Hey, you know, what should this thing be or whatever. Um, and that to me as a person who was at the time relatively uneducated, you know, I, I'd taken a few classes here and there, but I wasn't, wasn't a college graduate or anything. I'm not, not, you know, officially educated or whatever. And to have somebody come up and be like deferential was quite an experience. And I never, I never had that experience before. Um, and so that's the first time I felt that and it sort of exacerbated how I felt when I went back into the civilian world after I left the army and worked my first few jobs as sort of, you know, general peon, you know, go there, do this kind of thing where you're, you're sort of, you know, you don't have any, any sort of ruling over your own destiny. Uh, and I guess that's, that's what, that was more my question. And Kale, I'm going to get back to you. Let me just, I want to go to Jim and Brandon just real quick before we get back to Kale. Uh, what was the first job where you felt like, uh, you were respected or, or, or had, had garnered some level of respect? Hmm. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I feel like, I don't know. I feel like I don't have a lot of ego when it comes to that kind of stuff. I don't have a lot of time for it. Um, and I don't mean, I don't mean a job where you, where you're like allowed to order people around, but a job where you yeah. feel like you are treated with respect. Yeah. Um, probably my tasseling job. I worked there long enough that, you know, eventually I was in a, uh, position to supervise some of the other workers. Um, and I mean, pretty flat, uh, structure for the tasseling, but you know, there's probably, I don't know, 60 to hundred kids and, 
uh, adults that couldn't find anything better to do uh, any any given day. And uh, yeah, I, I think probably about, you know, five years into it, um, I felt like I had some respect at that job. And Brennan? I don't know that I've ever felt respected by a boss. Um, I've had less bad bosses and better, you know, worse bosses, but I don't know that I've ever felt respected by boss respected by fellow workers. I felt that a couple of times. Um, now my, my current job is one of those. I am in my current position for the last five years. Uh, anybody that knew anything about it has left the company. Uh, there's a couple of guys left who have done some jobs where I work, but I mean, I, I mean, they, it, it would be a bigger hassle to fire me than not. And uh, a lot of my uh, fellow employees, when they're asked to fill in for me, they're like, I can't do it. You know, and I don't, I, I think they probably could. I think it's a little bit more worker solidarity than anything, but it's been nice. All right, Kale, uh, just wanted to ask you the same question and then go on uh, with the other thing you were going to mention. So what's the first job where you felt like you, garnered some level of respect again and brandon i appreciate you making that distinction because i think that's important the idea of uh distinction to of being respected by your peers versus being respected by management i think the first time where i felt like i was respected at a job where it felt like i had some kind of authority was probably when i was working in the mall uh at a particular leather store and because Tim's I was an leather? assistant manager there. What? Tim's leather? No. Do do I need to say it? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, um yes, it was kinky leather. No. Um no, it's a it, it was a fairly office. upscale leather uh store. They sold fairly expensive stuff. And uh it just that was the first place where professionally I felt respected. Like people would come to me and be like, Hey, what should I do with this? Or, Hey, this happened. What should I do? Um, but in general, I'm pretty easy going. I'm pretty nice guy. It's easy to get along with. So, um, like I've always had kind of a camaraderie with my coworkers and even my management, uh, people above me, have still found me relatable enough to where, you know, they still show some mutual respect uh, regardless of their position in the company. Uh, the thing I wanted to move on to though was uh, there's an article in uh, from, or no, I'm sorry. There's a report from the Brookings Institute uh, called and I'm going to have to read this verbatim, uh, called The Dangerous Separation of the American Upper Middle Class. And this was something we touched on earlier, but we never really came back to, and so I want to kind of bring it back up. Uh, the American upper middle class is separating, slowly but surely, from the rest of society. This separation is most obvious in terms of income, where the top fifth have been prospering while the majority lags behind. But the separation is not just economic. Gaps are growing on a whole range of dimensions, including family structure, education, lifestyle, and geography. Indeed, these dimensions of advantage appear uh, to be clustered more tightly together, each thereby amplifying the effect of the other. That's just the first paragraph that goes on, but I figured that like that was enough to wet your beaks on that one. Um, so I would be reticent uh, about using Brookings too much. Brookings, so uh, Brookings, the Brookings Institute, for those that aren't familiar, is, is sort of a uh, Democrat, left-leaning, very, very slightly left-leaning uh, institute. Um, the thing I'd be careful with, so it's talking about the idea of the separate that the that the upper middle class is separating from the middle class. Um, and I think that's possibly true. Um, I, I think we are in uh, we are experiencing increased class stratification. Um, all the classes are separating. Um, 
I think that the, the, I mean, you know, we talked about the Uber wealth, you know, your, your Bezos and your, your Muscovites and so on um, are point was the, so far into the stratosphere of, of wealth that uh, um, well, there's actually a great Chris rock quote um, uh, which says, if poor people knew how rich, rich people are, there would be riots in the streets and they're, he's right. Um, we don't really understand how rich the really, it, it, it is almost like there is another class that's like above the owners that they're like the owners of the owners class. Um, and that is your, your Elon Musk and your, and your Jeff Bezos. Um, I think it's and, another thing where it's like people don't understand the definitions of stuff. Like you, like you talk about, uh, you don't understand the lines between the different uh, sections of class. Uh, like, uh, a simplification of that is look at um, uh, look up Google an image of a million dollars and then Google an image of a billion dollars. And you probably don't realize how much of a difference it is. Well, I, I think some of it is um, like we talk about class, like, you know, there's three classes, five classes, seven classes, like you were talking earlier. Um, there's but, not it makes it like, there. but it makes it seem like there's stairs. And if you just moved up the next step, you'd be in the next class, but it's like, maybe the first couple classes, it's like the first one's a step, the next one's 10 steps, the next one's 10 flights. And to get to Jeff Bezos, you're going to the moon. Like it's not a step, it's insanely far away. It's like you'd need a rocket to get there or something. Right. Um, Yeah. One of the things, so this, uh, the, the article that Kale brings up, uh, and again, this is all going to be linked below, um, sort of to bring up the idea of class conflict. Um, and one of the reasons why, Kale, I like this article, even though I disagree with it, um, because I think it, it, it brings up the idea of, of how does class conflict work and how do, you, how do, how do we feel about it? How, what, is, what is sort of the emotional attachment to it? And I think that the way it works from my perspective is that every class is always at war only with the people one class above and one class below. Um, and so if you are in, let's say the working poor, let's say you have, you, you know, you can afford an apartment and you can afford, you know, 1.2 children um, with your spouse and you can afford your groceries, but you, you're putting nothing away as far as savings, you're, you're investing nothing at all. Um, then the two classes that you're in conflict with are the lower middle class and the destitute. And so what motivates you as a class is to avoid becoming the destitute and to try and get into the working, uh, into the lower middle class. Um, and it's that kind of conflict. I think that's, that's harming us because there's no worker solidarity. We don't see ourselves as one working class, as 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 a class of workers where everybody that is working and isn't serving sort of the the the, the owner class um, is one class. Instead, we all see ourselves as uh, okay. I I am in the work. I am in the lower middle class, so I need to try and get into the middle middle class and avoid getting into the working class. And that is my only. And that's where the idea ideology of Brandon's binary system really comes into play. Well, and there's nothing, nothing would be more of a threat to the entire system, capitalist system, class system, than world class solidarity for the proletariat, for the working class. Because if like, if every single time we had a problem, everyone the world over went on a wildcat strike, until it was solved it's it's it would just be nothing it's maintaining it's even achieving that solidarity is is the real problem meanwhile the other two powers money and propaganda are working against us nonstop. well you know what it sort of brings to mind it brings to mind the idea of the filibuster especially in the u.s senate so in the, in the u.s senate you know any one senator can filibuster a bill uh, which used to be a relatively rare occurrence, you know, prior to the year 2001 or so. Um, and it takes 60 senators to overturn that, that, uh, um, that filibuster. Um, so in other words, it takes one person to prevent any laws from passing. So in the U S Senate, which is an institute 
an institution which is incredibly anti-democratic. Um, if you need to understand why the Senate is anti-democratic, just look at the population. Um, it is very obvious why the Senate is it's not a democratic institution. Um, whereas in the public, if we want to pass a law, you know, it takes incredible pressure. So you have the situation where uh, uh, the prevention of doing things has uh, the most power. Uh, it is incredibly easy to prevent things from happening, and it is incredibly difficult to do things. Um, and that benefits the establishment because the establishment wants nothing to happen. Um, and the way our government is set up with the Senate having you know, more power than the House, um, it makes doing nothing super easy, which is, again, part of the political problems we have in this country. And when you think about it, do you really want to pay these guys country. to do nothing? Sorry, Kale, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, look at how much these guys make every year. And then think about the fact their job is to do nothing. Well, I would be careful. You're so don't talk about the senator's salaries, because I guarantee you none of those senators are getting rich from their salaries. Um, Joe Manchin is not a millionaire because he's in the Senate. Well, he is a millionaire because he's in the Senate, but not because of his Senate salary. Um, it's not about a salary. And a lot of people will sidetrack you into that. They'll try to say, oh, these senators, these, these representatives make so much money. It's like, no, they don't. They don't make very much money, comparatively speaking. I think the, the, the current uh, salary of a senator is what, 200000 250000 something like that. Um, Joe Manchin, for example, he made twice as much money uh, off of his coal mine than he did his Senate salary. Um, well, and I think it, there's also, you know, you're bringing up, uh, Kale, uh, the, the billionaires and then the super wealthy. I think people don't understand really large numbers too. I, I was just looking it up out of curiosity. 1 million seconds is roughly 12 days ago. 1 billion seconds is roughly 31 and a half years ago. I mean, just the difference between a million and billion is just astronomical and well jim pointed out i i don't know that that thing is actually in the link that little slider on basis is what wealth but it's just it, it's not something the human brain is really geared toward comprehending right yeah uh the the numbers we we could talk for hours just on the numbers like how how does the human brain define a billion i mean a billion is 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 um, you know, it's one of those things I, we talked to Kale earlier about, you know, not defining class based on a number. Uh, but if you got a billion dollars, you're in the upper class. Yeah. You know, so that's the one place where I'll definitely say if you're over a billion, you're definitely in the upper class. Um, I mean, the, the, what you can get for that. Um, and on top of that, if, if you're in that class, what you can get just because you're wealthy. You know, you can get loans at zero percent interest or close to zero percent interest. That's not something. Not else on it. Eventually, you'll have so. I'm sorry, Jim. Y'all, I'm sorry. Uh, that's when what you have so doing. much money, you'll just you don't even need to make more money. You just your money makes money on its own. You just sit there and watch it. But go ahead. I don't even remember what I was saying. But uh, but even uh, like Mike was saying uh even the people that have a billion dollars are trying to not be upper millionaires and want to be multi-billionaires right they aren't they aren't content they're like yeah i have this yacht but look at that guy he has a yacht that's three, three times as big as mine there's a, i mean there's always because you else. don't want to be the guy who is on the billionaire list this year but not on the billionaire list next year Right. And so they're literally willing to fuck over their workers and steal millions and millions of dollars from them just to ensure they don't fall below a certain list in a magazine that nobody reads. Yeah. I mean, if that doesn't or tell the you what class is in this country. Like. Yeah. Go ahead, Brandon. I'm sorry. That... Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's all 
it's not just a magazine that nobody reads. It's also for the opinions of people they probably don't like. Right, right. It's uh, it's gross. It's all really, really gross. Um, was uh, was John Barron the uh, fake name that Trump gave when he did yes. those interviews yeah. Yeah, to uh, it, yeah. in- inflate his um value in those magazines? I mean that I. I that's really the one he used to tell everybody he was sleeping with Madonna too. What a ding dong! <laughs> By the way, that's the perfect insult for Donald Trump. He's a ding dong. I love calling people ding dongs. Um, well, but we've talked also, about also chosen by God and uh, um, right to yes. be the great leader. So by Republican know, Jesus, right? I don't know how you square that. So. I believe his name is Reagan Jesus. Um, we talked about this quite a bit. Um, and, uh, but, uh, Kale, do you have any sort of final thoughts closing out on this? I think we might talk about this again. I feel like we've kind of only scratched the surface. The, uh, last thing I want to leave everybody with is, uh, Stanford, uh, printed a book. It's called, uh, social class and changing families in an uneven and unequal America. Uh, I think everybody that is interested in this topic might take a gander at that. All right, Brandon. And by the way, yes, I'm aware my camera died. It's fine. There's at one point uh, I, I ended the anti work with a quote from somebody who said it better and I'm going to do it again. Uh, This is from Eugene Debs Twitter account. Uh, The working class alone does the world's work has created its capital produced its wealth constructed its mills and factories, dug its canals, made its roadbeds, laid its rails and separate and operates its trains, spanned the rivers and bridges and tunneled the mountains. That's a good one. I you can follow Eugene V Debs on Twitter even though he's been dead for 80 years, a long time. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Jim? Uh a few things. One um we talk quite a bit about stolen wages and uh, I'm not an expert in capitalism, but we, we talk, kind of touched on this in the anti-work, you know, it really seems like if we were in a perfect capitalist system, there wouldn't be profits or there would be very little profits because, you know, the, the margins would be razor thin. You wouldn't be able to amass billions and billions and billions of dollars of wealth because you'd have so much competition that you'd be having to be razor thin with your profit margin, right? Um, And probably the only people that'd be making money from the company are the people that are working there or the people that are managing. Uh, So that's one thought. Uh, Another one is, I didn't get a chance to work this in. I read this today that um, there's kind of a new aspect of class right now. And that's the people that can relocate geographically with virtual work and the people that can't. And it really does not break down uh, simply across um, what we normally think of as class strata. There's all sorts of people at, at different class strata that can either Relocate. I believe the phrase I've heard is digital nomads. Um, So I I thought that was interesting that the, I mean, the article, it was really very specific to healthcare workers and how they're, um, obviously they've had a really hard go of it, but, uh, but they don't have an option of um, being remote and being safe. Um, so I, I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, the last thing is a quote, and I don't remember who. This is from Rosa Luxemburg. And the quote is, those who do not move do not notice their chains. It's true. Rosa Luxemburg's pretty good. Um, I'll close out with a uh, Kurt Vonnegut quote that isn't from Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, and it is one from Sirens of Titan. I, I came across this one, even though I've read the book a bunch of times, I didn't remember this one. Um, it's his system was so idiotically simple that some people can't understand it, no matter how often it is explained. Uh, explained. 
the people who can't understand it are people who believe for their own peace of mind that tremendous wealth can only be produced by tremendous cleverness. And that is our country today. Because if you're rich, you must be tremendously clever. Uh, I want to thank you- everybody for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. And uh, even though you can't see me, I'm raising my glass. Have a good drink. Have a good day. Goodbye, my people. See you, everybody.